Hi everyone, we'll start in a few seconds just when all the participants have entered into the room. Okay, welcome everyone to our second session of the day of our second day of TGE conference. Um, hopefully many of you joined us either for the first session today and or yesterday. So welcome back to those of you. If you're just joining us for this session, then a big welcome and it's a great session to join. I'm gonna hand over to Carlos in a minute to start sharing. Just a reminder that this session ends at five to the hour. And then on the hour, we'll have our networking mixer session, which is ho hosted by Ed. Um, and this was very successful yesterday as an opportunity to keep the chat going. So please do stay with us if you can. And if you haven't registered for that mixing session, you can still do that on the CTEL website. So over to you, Carlos. The typical mistake of un not unmuting myself. Welcome everybody to the, uh, I think it's the third session uh, to the Teaching Economics uh, to Write uh, session. We have not three, but four fantastic panelists. They're all from the US and I'm sure we're all gonna learn um, a lot from them. We've got first Janice and Ling from Miami University. And then we're gonna follow by Paul, uh, who's from University of Northwest and St. Paul. And then finally, we'll move to Tony uh, from Dickinson University. Just to remind everybody that the session has been recorded. So if you don't want your face to show, just uh, um, uh, turn your ca camera uh, off when the, the, the Q&A session uh, opens. And again, use the chat to make comments, but uh, we would appreciate if you made all your questions in the Q&A um, uh, tab uh, and people can upvote your questions going up and down. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with the format. This is already our third session. So I'm gonna pass on uh, without delay to, to Janice and Ling. Good morning to all of you in the US, maybe good afternoon to, to others of you. Um, bear with me a minute while I start screen sharing. Okay, can somebody give me a hint how to yeah, present? That, that present button up there to the upper right by the share upper. button. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was covered because I'm trying to look at the questions while I do it. Thank you. Um, I'm Janice Kinghorn and I'm here with my colleague Ling Xiao. We are from Miami University, which is in Oxford, Ohio, not Florida. So we are in the Midwest. And we want to talk to you about a project that we have um, undertaken. We've been working on it a few years now, um, how to infuse writing in the economics department. Um, this first slide um, gives you a link to something our, our um, the president of the university published, um, writing as thinking. Um, this was after th this was published after our project, um, but it was so poignant because that is one of the things that that we learn throughout this project is we are not simply teaching students to write, but you could teach them how to think like an economist through writing. Now, going into this project, uh, we thought uh, that writing looked a bit like this. It's stuff you did in English class, right? Um, now, we understood, okay, yeah, economists write papers and all, but when you think about um, how to teach students to write and infusing writing in the curriculum. I, th I think most of our faculty had an idea that this is what uh, this is what we were going to be doing. Um, you know, worrying about what the font was, what the format was, you know, what the heading was, um, things that that were not economics. Another worry that our faculty have with, had when we talked about infusing writing in, in economics is. Um, we would spend a whole lot of time 
doing things like this, taking our red pen and correcting grammar, correcting um, punctuation. And we got a lot of, um, you know, we don't know how to do this. Doesn't, don't they learn this in English? Um, we're, we're economists. Can't we worry about the economics and have someone else teach them how to write? Um, what we learned through this project, and, and our project was um, undertaken with the help of the Writing Center at the university, is that we already teach students how to communicate in written form. We hadn't in the past thought about it explicitly as writing because it looked a little different than what happens in English class, and we talk about it a little different. For example, the, the classic supply and demand, de demand diagram um, speaks to us. It's written communication, and it tells us a story um, more clearly to someone trained in reading it um, than could be told using a paragraph um, and, and a narrative. Um, it has a, a particular grammar to it. Um, it, it, it has a particular implied audience to it and has, it has certain stylistic elements. And, and you all probably recognize this when you teach, um, principles and you have to tell students, okay, indicate which is the first demand curve and which is the second demand curve so we know which way it shifts, right? And, and, and so there's elements of this picture, um, that are written communication but look very different than the writing students would do in an English class. Um, another example of, of, of a form of writing you might see in an economics class, but not an English class. Um, tables, figures, diagrams, of course, we use them to clearly communicate. Um, and in class, we have a lot of emphasis on how to properly use these tools. We just never previously thought about them as teaching students to write. Um, another example, um, th this is something that would be understandable to someone trained in economics because we understand the conventions. Uh, we know how to read this. We, we, it, it's, um, it's presented in a very standard format. Um, but again, our students don't know this because they haven't been taught to write in this way. Um, Let's see, I'm, okay. Um, another example of how we write in economics comes from our econometrics class. Um, this was a really interesting project one of our, our faculty came up with, um, using econometrics to help decide where to, which college to apply to. Um, it, it, it required um, standard econometrics and an empirical analysis Yet it, re re it resulted in a letter to a general audience, to somebody that doesn't understand um, the, the details of econometrics um, and needed a particular result. So it was a writing project our, our econometrics faculty came up with. Um, this, was a, th this example comes from intermediate microeconomics. Um, it, it's a standard problem like many of us do in principles and intermediate theory, but the difference here is the emphasis on it had to be clearly written. Students had to explain why. It wasn't good enough um, to, simply, uh, to simply solve the problem, but there was an emphasis on writing to explain, again, writing as thinking. Um, Here's another example. A true-false question can go beyond true-false to explain your answer and explaining how economists would write to explain. Write with evidence, and that evidence generally takes the form of economic logic explained in words, graphs, or mathematical argument. So an emphasis on how we communicate. Um, Ling, I'll stop sharing and you want to take over some more examples? Uh, sure, thanks Janice. Let me share my screen.
Uh, writing in large classes um, presents some additional challenges in grading and offering timely feedback. One solution is to craft you know, small but impactful writing assignments. Another solution is we can break up a big end of semester project into smaller chunks to be completed throughout the semester. So um, our faculty has used assignments such as macro forecasting game and country report project and online discussions such as this one on Uber to encourage economic writing and thinking um, in large enrollment classes. Okay, and next, Janice, she will be again talking about some more specific lessons that we have learned from teaching writing in economics. Janice, okay, back to you again. Um, okay, so here are some of our takeaways. I know we are running out of time. Um, audience awareness is so important and something our faculty had not at all thought about. That in every assignment, it is so important that the student understands what is their intended audience, why is it important, why is this piece of writing important for their intended audience, and what what, what is the level of background the intended audience has? Um, because of of course that would that that would dictate you know how how technical how technical it is. Um, uh, the second takeaway is. Um, the details that you have to teach them about how economists communicate. Okay, for example, economists describe by using graphs and tables. Um, they, they need to know this and our faculty just took that for granted and didn't realize that it's something you had to teach students because they didn't automatically know it. And it was something that certainly in English professor could not have taught uh, because the English department doesn't know how how economists how economists communicate. Uh, here here are some ways economists communicate that we had to teach students how to construct because they didn't automatically know that there wasn't another department that taught how to construct um, tables that spoke like these do. OK, so key takeaways. Uh, clear writing is clear thinking. So we're not just teaching about writing at the expense of economics, but when we teach writing, we are teaching them how to clearly think about economics. Um, number two, we, we had expectations that students would write like an economist without realizing that we had to first explicitly teach it. Um, number three, elements of writing instructions are simply elements of, of good instruction. Again, they, it wasn't going to take time away from teaching economics. Um, it, it was simply reinforcing their learning in economics. Um, and, and number four, economists have conventions that are different from other different disciplines. And we needed to explicitly teach students what those conventions are and why they are important to us. For example, we use evidence. Um, not and, and and if they were going to write for an audience as an economist, they also needed to use evidence to back up uh, what they were what they were saying. Um, so those are our feedbacks. I know I went that through that very quickly, uh, but but please please put your questions in there because uh, we love we love to talk about this work. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Um, uh, Janice uh, and Ling. Um, as Janice said, please re remember to uh, post your questions on, um, on the Q&A. Um, and uh, I will move on straight away to, to our second uh, speaker, who is Paul. So Paul, please take the floor. Thank you, Carlos. And uh, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate being here. Um, I do want to just kind of give you an idea Oh, didn't start the video yet. There we go. Hopefully we're we're on set now. Um, give you just a real quick brief background of uh, 
why I thought this was such a great chance for me to present what, what happened this last semester, obviously with COVID-19, um, really put a, a damper on some of the activities I like to do when I teach. So um, I use this exercise and it turned out to be very, very popular and it was a writing exercise. Um, I'm sure just about everyone else, you know, when, especially in economics or anything else, they talk about writing, students tend to cringe a little bit. So I was really surprised uh, with the overall feedback to this. And so basically what it is, is I was trying to connect the economic content with the, you know, with the current concepts that we are learning about. Um, and uh, it was, it was pretty simple. Uh, basically, I just posted uh, six different articles over a six week period for my undergrad micro class. Um, and I just I posed a question. And the only thing they had to do really was connect something in the uh, report to something we learned that week. Now, this is a, you know, economics 101 class, so to speak. So, you know, I realized that the students probably didn't have a ton to say, but they should have had at least something, something they could kind of pull out of the textbook and see for themselves. Uh, secondly, my goal with this was to expose them to all sorts of media. You'll notice through these uh, different reports, these different uh, articles, excuse me, they're all from different sources. Uh, they're from you know, economic sources and business sources and your, your mass public publication sources. Uh, so I wanted to expose them to all different types of biases, all different types of uh, reporting styles uh, and let them know what they're learning about is very applicable. Uh, now, of course, since this was an intro uh, class and there's a lot of students, you know, my own thought was, well, I don't have time to, you know, grade hundreds of papers each week. Um, and so basically what it was just one paragraph, uh, one, um, you know, university level paragraph, you know, at least five to seven sentences, well-structured, you know, an intro transitions, those kinds of things. I did, you know, include some grammar, uh, to this. It wasn't just necessarily a free form, but I wanted to give them, you know, some room to kind of explore and try, and try to and try to write out. So I thought for the remainder of the, the presentation here real quick, I'm just going to go through some of these articles that I posted throughout the week and give you um, a little bit of a, um, you know, uh, ad hoc response. Uh, some of the responses you see here, uh, they're not uh, verbatim. Um, I did paraphrase them. Uh, but to give you uh, kind of an idea, um, uh, but you know, here my the very first week. So what I've done these slides, what you're going to see here is the title of the chapter. So this was intro micro. And we start talking about consumer choice and elasticity. Uh, the question I posed, and then you know, just a, a response or two that I, that I got from these questions. Now, uh, this article I'm not necessarily going to go into much uh, because you're going to see this article again. But basically, this is uh, about the fact that. Um, uh, economists have started talking about this food desert, especially in the in the rural areas, uh, where the grocers back in the you know in the 1950s were kind of pushed out by the WalMarts and, and the large grocers in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and now we're seeing these large grocers actually leave some of these areas, and the the small town grocers are not coming back. In fact, what's happening is we're getting some of these really really discount stores uh, that do not necessarily have fresh fruits and vegetables. You know, they have a lot of processed and packaged foods. And they are the ones who are kind of coming back into these towns. Uh, more on this article in a second, I'm, and I'm gonna leave this off. Um, second week, we talked about costs and the supply of goods. Uh, so you're talking about your average fixed cost, your average variable cost, you know, your average total costs. And this article was from the Harvard Business Review. Uh, and it's a, it's a currently a hot topic, of course, and you know, what can robots do for retail is the title of the article. This was published in October of 2020. Now, keep those dates in mind, because you're going to see how these dates become even uh, more and more recent as we go through. So we taught this in January of 2021. And the question is, you know, what happens when you take uh, a labor, obviously, which is a variable cost, and, you know, try to transition it into a fixed cost, like with these robots, you know, look at your average cost curves. Well, if you, if you take a variable cost and try to make it a fixed cost, yeah, you're going to get, uh, you know, it's going to be pretty expensive up front, but then you can kind of push out the volume in order to make that up. Uh, and so you can see some of the responses to that. Uh, this is one of my favorites the very next week on January 29th, the very week we were uh, excuse me, teaching about the price takers and the competitive process. This article comes up from Bloomberg uh, Finance, and that is that U.S. cotton output was being undercut 
by the rally in grains. And so what was happening here was that uh, grain prices were going up, corn and wheat, because uh, China was importing a lot more in January. So cotton farmers were um, uh, sacrificing, were flipping their fields from cotton into these grains. So the cotton output was dropping because the farmers could easily enter into the grain markets, right? Because there's no product differentiation. Like as we like to say in our class, you know, a soybean is a soybean is a soybean, right? So if you can, you know, get into that market very, very easily, there's no barriers to entry. Well, then, you know, it's very easy to do that. And here, this article, um, as, as the, um, you know, response says, pretty much just right from our pages in our econ book is happening right that moment, right that week while we were teaching it. Uh, the next week, we started talking about price searchers markets with low barriers to entry, right? Uh, monop monopolistic uh, competition, if you will. At the same time, uh, this uh, article came out right when the students were starting to plan their spring breaks. Uh, and so the local uh, airline, Sun Country, which is local to where I teach in Minneapolis, St. Paul area, had come out uh, in the middle of the pandemic and said that they were um, increasing their routes to 16 new routes serving the, the local airport. And uh, this was quite contrary to what you were hearing about in the airline fields at that time, right? Our airlines were, revenue was dropping. Uh, and so we talked about it. how could this be? How can this airline be introducing 16 new routes? And, you know, the responses were fantastic on it. They absolutely nailed it, right? It's very easy for Sun Country to open up an airline route because they're already, you know, licensed by the government, right? They have the planes, they have the staff. It's, they, they can be flexible to that demand. They, you know, they're in a price searchers market with some differentiation, but there's very low barriers to entry. So it all made sense to them. Oh yeah, we, we, we can see this kind of reaction in the airlines. Um, the next one was obviously the monopolistic market. This one kind of hit pretty home to them because North Dakota is a border state to Minnesota. Uh, it's one of the less you know, populated states in the country, but a lot of the students you know, either have been there or from there or know about North Dakota. And here you have this article about North Dakota, Apple and Google, which the students are very familiar with, and the New York in the New York Times happening the very week we're talking about it. And this idea that how you know Google and Apple have this market power uh, with respect to how much they take off selling their apps. So the students were able to relate to that very well. And then the last week I brought back that Dollar General store just to show them that there's many levels. In this case, uh, this was the chapter on income inequality and poverty. And the idea was that these Dollar General stores are coming back in because you know the income had dropped so much in the rural levels. And I really like this response because you could start to see the students really get involved. They, some of them were actually trying to find a solution to this, which was absolutely fantastic. You know, community gardens is a way to grow your own fresh vegetables and fruits versus you know relying on the grocers, which I thought was, was very impressive. Um, the end result of using these current concepts and tying it into uh, the current content that they're listening to, uh, that they're reading about and that we're teaching about, um, was fantastic. Again, really kind of blew me away. Um, you know, as you can see on the screen here, they're learning about the world of economics uh, and, and discussing, discussing the economic reasons for why these things are happening. Because we would come back that next week after the responses came in and we'd lecture about it. We'd talk about it. Um, these, I call them the headline of the weeks. So that's what the HOTWs are. Um, you know, and it did lead to these interactive lectures and, and the students, you know, really enjoyed it. In fact, the funny thing is, I had students who wouldn't do their normal homework, uh, but who would ultimately uh, respond on these articles. Uh, and so it was, you know, a really conducive way to get students to write uh, and to pull in, you know, current topics and then ultimately, you know, leverage off of what they're learning at the same time. So I was very excited about it, something I do plan on uh, pushing on forward. So, Carlos, with that, um, I, you know, that, that's all I have for the time being. Fantastic. Paul, thank you very much for sticking to the time. You actually had another minute to, um, uh, to, to, to use, but we can use it in the Q&A that's going to follow uh, um, uh, after Tony uh, gives his talk, and I'm going to pass on straight to him. So, Tony, take the floor. Uh, thank you all. You guys are just looking at my desktop probably here. There we go. Uh, okay, so today I'm going to, uh, so I'm Tony Underwood. I'm presenting some material uh, that's with my colleague in my department, Emily Marshall, uh, that describes a project that we do here in our advanced econometrics class. Uh, and I will talk first a little bit about 
our motivation for doing this project the way we do it and teaching these reproducible um, research methods along the way. Uh, and then talk a little bit about what we actually do in the project, uh, why we do it, and uh, talk how you, we can share some of our project resources with you and why we think they're helpful. Uh, so first, in terms of motivation, the motivation is really twofold. The, our first motivation comes from that actually doing economics, doing economic research is one of the best ways to get students to understand how to think like an economist. And as we heard from Janice earlier, part of thinking like an economist is learning how to write like an economist. And as many of you have mentioned in the chat, we do have these disciplinary conventions that do differ based on what audience we are reading, um, what audience will be reading this content. So um, we know that that economic research itself has become increasingly empirical and that when you're doing empirical research, both the American Statistical Association and says that we have a responsibility, an ethical responsibility to promote the sharing of data and methods and make this documentation, documentation for replication available. As many of you probably know, the American Economic Association recently appointed its first data editor and ramped up requirements for reproducibility and data availability. Um, so that was our first motivation, that doing economic research um, is important and that that research is becoming increasingly empirical and needs to be more transparent. Uh, the second motivation, as many of you suggested already, is that writing helps students learn, in particular writing how, um, to, how we use writing in our discipline uh, to promote learning. And so there is some eviden evidence of this in the teaching literature. And what um, McGoldrick pointed out over 10 years ago was that while many economics departments have formal writing requirements, there are, it's not that common for departments to offer courses dedicated to the research process uh, or offer explicitly what we would consider research methods courses uh, that are teaching the process of research and writing and economics. Um, so that's what ultimately uh, led us to develop a kind of process oriented approach to teaching writing and to teaching um, econometrics in this course. So that leads us to our learning objectives, right? The big one, be able to conduct this applied empirical research. I will put these up here and that, I will try not to read them completely, but uh, we use Stata. You of course could use whatever uh, so statistical software you wanted in this project, um, but they need to learn Stata, some data management skills and coding practices for reproducibility. They need to know how to put their research question in the context of the existing literature through a literature review. Uh, one of the things I won't have time to talk about here is that we spend a lot of time talking about the purpose and structure of a literature review uh, in economics, which is, um, I think, markedly different than how it's used in other disciplines. Uh, and then, of course, uh, how to pull all of that together into a well-developed uh, research paper. The big thing here is on doing, right? They're having to do this. And the way we, had, we structured this process to facilitate um, students actually being successful in this endeavor was by sequencing the project, as I'll talk more about in a second, and requiring this replication documentation, right? And the idea here is to slow students down in a good way. What we had, before we kind of overhauled this project and implemented this reproducible structure, what we saw both in the context of an empirical project for econometrics and in writing more generally, is that students are just in a really, really big hurry to get to the final product, right? There's this rush, I always called it the rush to regress, right? They wanna to get to that regression, they wanna get the data in, they wanna run the regression, they wanna to get to that final paper, right? And in doing so, a lot of errors can be made and um, you lose a lot of, and the papers themselves ended up being underdeveloped. So having these reproducible requirements and having the progress sequenced really helps in this regard. So what we do to make this possible is we have really detailed prompts at each phase. Yes, this is super time consuming. There's a high fixed cost, but a lower marginal cost because you have these rubrics to help you provide feedback along the way. And of course, that's one of the reasons we're doing this. And I'm here today is that uh, we are making all these uh, available to you. So as I said, why we do this this way, they focus too much on the product. 
by redirecting their focus to the process, we end up improving the final product. And so they learn to teach research and writing as a recursive process, kind of a tool of discovery, that it's not a linear thing. You start the paper, you finish the paper. Um, that research itself is a learning experience. Uh, and this is how most economists actually operate in our own research. Okay, so as I said, we do this through sequencing with detailed prompt and requiring that replication documentation. Here's the replication folder we require. This is a, an adaptation of the tier protocol, protocol put together by Project Tier out of Haverford College. Uh, they have an original data folder, an analysis data folder, a command files folder, and a documents folder. And over the course of the semester, uh, we can talk more about this in the Q&A perhaps, but what we do is have a shared folder and students upload components of this project over the course of the semester um, in what amounts to basically seven different phases over the course of a 15 week semester, 16 week semester. Uh, that's how that, this is how that ends up looking. Uh, so early on, they get their formal structure set up and where they're going to be saving their work. They um, develop an annotated bibliography, they develop a research question, and you can see then the different tasks uh, as we progress through the semester, a proposal, a metadata guide, a literature review, their data and methods section, the results section, and then of course, pulling it all together at the end with the final uh, project folder, which includes the final paper, a readme file, and all of the other documentation necessary so that I, in, in grading it, can uh, click through their do files, execute them all, and reproduce the regressions um, and the results that they've uh, developed. Okay, so finally, well here, I will, just because I think this is a fun figure, the idea of this paper was to keep them here, right? This is what we call the recursive part of the project, right? And slowing them down in processing their data, finding sources and analyzing them, developing the research question, and developing a literature review and a data and method section that are derived from both um, what the existing literature says and what data availability constraints mandate. Uh, before they get to estimating that final model and they push to then for the project becoming linear, developing those conclusions and writing the final paper. So that's the idea, kind of keep them in that early recursive space longer so that the ideas and the analysis that they develop um, are more thoughtful by the end. Okay, so one important component to this is that the students cannot view these different phases and these different deadlines as drafts. So we do grade each of these final components. Uh, this is kind of how this is written in my syllabus for the class. What you'll notice firstly is that this is a big deal of the course, right? The, I do teach content in here. We're teaching advanced econometric methods in this course. They have other workshops and homeworks, but this project makes up nearly half of their course grade, 45% of the course grade that 45% is allocated across these seven different components. The actual final project product, the research paper and the final project folder is only 20% of their grade. Uh, thanks, Carlos, I'm wrapping up here. So what we do is we use rubrics, which uh, personally um, I resisted using for a long time, uh, but they do make things more straightforward. They, make our expectations transparent to the students. And it means that our feedback is coordinated um, with some of the practice activities we do, which are embedded in some of our workshops uh, and homeworks over the course of the semester. Okay, so finally, um, as I said, the prompts and rubrics I've made available online. I'm actually due to update, update them with the most recent versions uh, soon. Uh, they're adaptable, uh, they are password protected, so students can go grab them whenever they want. Uh, you, can, you can email me for access, I'm happy to share them with you. Uh, there's a published version of this work that uh, Emily and I put together uh, in JEE um, in late 2019 that was published. I was certainly happy to share a copy with that for you if you don't have access. Thank you. 
thank you, Tony, uh, very much for keeping uh, to the time. Um, it's been really, really fantastic uh, presentations. Um, like Steffi, I'm going to give about 30 seconds for people to go through the list of questions that uh, we have in the Q&A and ask people to upvote your favorite ones or add new questions uh, so that we can start um, obviously going through, through the favorite ones. Okay, so please go through the Q&A. 20 seconds and, and then we'll start. Okay, so we can still see the ranking uh, keeping changing, uh, but we, I think we can start. The first, the winner question is to Ling. I was actually thinking uh, uh, about this when Paul was presenting, is can, can, we, all, can we not get a robot to do the, all the marking that we need to do? I mean, that would be fantastic. Uh, but Ling, uh, how do you grade hundreds of written assignments in large lecture courses? Well, I have learned a few things from our, you know, writing center um, and other colleagues. I think one way is I always like to break um, students into groups and especially in pairs because that way they get to work with other students, but uh, I can minimize like the free writing problem. Um, so if you pick students in pairs, that cuts down <laughs> your grading by half. And also another trick is like Paul mentioned, I give short writing assignments so that I can grade them very quickly just by glancing them. And another um, technique is, you know, with the online learning management system, I choose to give feedback, like kind of personal feedback about a portion of uh, student submissions each week. So I don't have time to give feedbacks um, on every submission each week. I may rotate each week, say I do uh, maybe 10% of the students this week and the next week I move on to uh, the next um, group uh, of submissions. So that way students feel like, you know, uh, the writing that they do really matters they, and they get um, some personal um, and timely feedback for their um, for their writing and other assignments. Okay, well, thank you yeah. very much. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we have a question uh, again from from Douglas, I think it was the, the previous one. Uh, do you give students individual feedback on their um, um, weekly uh, question that you set, Paul, uh, do you use a rubric, basically? Sure. Um, no, not necessarily. I do give them feedback. Uh, you know, as Ling pointed out, you can kind of get through uh, these five to seven sentences pretty easily. Uh, most of the feedback is great job. I like this point. Um, you know, the only rubric was that they needed to connect a concept in the article to something we learned. And so I let them know that, you know, obviously I've read these articles. There's something in here, at least one thing in here that um, I think you can connect. Um, and I, we, we tend to, you know, lead into it a little bit, uh, but I, I leave it wide open. If there is something else that they can connect that I didn't think about, they get full credit. Um, and I've had, I had that happen a few times and that, that's what kind of made it fun on my end. It's like, wow, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So the only rubric was they needed to connect a concept, whether it was income and elasticity, whether it was average variable cost, whatever was in that week's content, um, they needed to connect. Okay, great. Thank you, Paul. Um, now we've got a question from Clodagh to all panelists. I'm going to start with, with Tony because we haven't heard from him yet. Uh, when you think about teaching economists to write, do you specify who they should think the reader is? I mean, is it for specialist um, audiences? Is it for the general public? How much does this matter? Well, it's a great question. And I think others could have something valuable here too. I mean, in the, in the project in my econometrics class, I always tell them 
their audience really should be other members of the class, right? And so, yes, it's me, but really they should be writing in a way that's consistent with conventions. And they're, you know, here what's mostly juniors and junior and senior economics majors or quantitative economics majors. And so they should be using technical and academic language, but that um, I always, <laughs> um, as, as the, some of you were talking about in the chat, uh, we use, Economists tend to be unreason unreasonably uh, technical, even when we don't need to be. Uh, and so, I, you know, one of the things I emphasize there is that you can be academic, but still talk like a human. And uh, that is, I think, a difficult balance often to try to demonstrate for students. Uh, and so some what I have done informally uh, to get at that is to say, okay, if you were a, say, um, a data journalist in some ways that the, think of some of the good articles we see in the New York Times or Vox, right? Academic writing doesn't have to be all that much different than that um, in talking through some of the summer statistics and some of your results uh, where you have some technical pieces around the edges of that. So I think it matters a lot what you think your audience is, uh, but demonstrating that can be tough. Thank you, Tony. Um, maybe I'd ask uh, Janice now, because we haven't heard from her. Uh, do you think economists should write like humans as well? I, I, I think they should write like humans. And I, I think in asking them to do so, you can really understand their thinking process. Um, because often they'll use technical words and jargon maybe to cover up that they don't quite understand it. And, and so assignments like explain to your grandmother how um, really to, to do that, you really have to understand something. Um, and so not only should they be able to do that, but I think it, it helps clarify their own thinking. Okay, thank you. Then I always, Paul, do you have anything to add? Or? Uh, no, I just uh, piggyback on what they said. My really biggest goal was that they should be able to write to explain honestly to their parents um, you know something they learned about in in a in a uh, uh, you know maybe a popular you know current um, uh, argument. So absolutely, you know you know write so that you can uh, you know that anybody can read it. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the next question because it's for Lynn uh, and Janice. Um, Joe asks, uh, I'm interested to find out how you scaffold longer writing tasks. I mean, what what kind of um, scaffolding do you provide to your students? So I have a, a long paper that's due at the end of the term, but they turn in pieces of that a during the semester. And, and so I've broken down the, what they have to do for that. And, and it could be as simple as turn in your thesis statement, turn in your bibliography, um, you know, turn in your first graph. And so they're able to get feedback on different pieces prior to the final project. Um, not only does this improve their final project, but to the question we had earlier, it makes your grading easier um, because giving feedback on a thesis statement or a graph is a lot easier than, than, than um, feedback on the entire paper. And you get better quality work. And I would argue better quality work is a lot less time consuming to grade. Um, I, 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 I want to share another idea that I found a very useful, and that is give public feedback on these parts. So for example, if students um, had to turn in a thesis statement, I might ask for volunteers to project their statement on, on, on the screen. And as a class, we would talk about what we like about it, what needs to be improved, how might you improve it. So that's another way um, to save some time so you, you don't necessarily have to give feedback to every individual student, but they're learning how to improve their own work because you're giving this this public feedback. Okay. Um, don't know if Ling has anything to add to that reply. Oh, I totally echo what Janice just, just mentioned. And I also like uh, Tony's presentation on how, you know, at different levels of teaching econ courses, you it's a good practice to scaffold a final end project into 
actionable smaller steps throughout the semester. So, you know, if you assign a students to do students to do presentations at the end of the semester, it's better to ask them to make preps throughout the semester instead of uh, waiting for the project uh, for the presentation in the end, because oftentimes I find, especially in like the courses I teach, which is uh, 300 level elective courses, students, they tend to wait kind of until the last minute to do the project project or presentation if it's assigned to, you know, um, to happen at the end of the semester. So um, I, I think scaffolding is is a, is a great way to um, to uh, to combat that uh, procrastination. OK. Well, thank you very much. Now, Fabio asks a question now um, that, uh, on a topic that is really important for UK universities. Uh, how can we address inclusivity um, in teaching writing when we have classes with high proportion of non-native um, uh, speakers with very very different levels of proficiency? So um, it's it's a question for all. So maybe we can start with, with Tony and uh, and move on to to the others. Well, I mean, I think this is super important. I mean, you know, in our quantitative economics major here at Dickinson College, um, you know, around half of our students, uh, my international students, and um, are simultaneously learning how to write like an economist and uh, and write in English effectively. And uh, it's a very real concern. And I, the, it's in part why I believe teaching the conventions of the discipline and um, styles of writing like humans, uh, but also in an academic way, uh, is super important both for native speakers and non-native speakers. I think there are some uh, th there are some common errors that both um, students of all backgrounds, I think, um, get settled into, bad habits almost. Uh, and some of that comes from some of the early writing I think they're doing um, in either their college career or in high school. So um, I try to look beyond the different sets of challenges and try to find the source of common challenges across both groups of students, those that are have always written in English and those that are learning to do so. Uh, because I think some of the best practices are universal. And so if you can get them to understand here's what tends to work and why, um, say in talking about your results, writing a good summary of a, re say, regression results table. Um, I think um, that is readable, um, but also somewhat technical, goes a long way of just understanding best practices for writing in English more broadly. So uh, I don't know, that's how I've tended to approach that. Very good answer. Uh, Paul, do you have anything you'd like to add or do you do your university deals with it differently? Uh, I'll just, you know, from from my perspective and from, you know, the topic of what we talked about, I did mention that, you know, I, I tried to personally um, find as many sources uh, of different articles that I could. Uh, you might have noticed, you know, Bloomberg is a is a finance um, capital markets resource. Obviously, New York Times is a mass media. That first article I showed was from Civil Eats, which is a very small uh, publication. Um, and so, you know, in order to what we do when we review these articles after they submitted their si uh, assignments, we try to talk about and maybe discover some of the biases um, that these reporters may or may not have. Uh, but also, you know, we try to figure out who their real audience was and, you know, how they chose their writing style to that. Um, you know, going forward, and, you know, from what I'm hearing from Tony and from other people is, you know, an idea that popped in my head is that maybe as I continue this program, I might offer up students to find their own articles for me, you know, uh, let them search out uh, throughout whatever, you know, what they're typically, you know, used to reading and, um, and present it to me saying, hey, this might be a good article for next week, or this might be a good article, and maybe give, give them points then if I decide to choose on that. So that might be a way for them to also exercise a little bit of what they're comfortable with as well. Thank you. So maybe I'll, I'll move on to Janice and, and, and ask a slightly different related question. Uh, we know that economics is biased towards them male um, gender uh, in terms of the profession, number of students and so on. So how do we make more inclusive also along the gender lines uh, in terms of writing? 
Um, I, I'll share an idea that I have tried to play with. I certainly don't have the grand answer, but, um, and that is play with our language. You know, when you write, even when you write multiple choice questions, um, play with, you know, gender neutral words, um, you know, examples of, of um, maybe non-traditional um, relationships, just kind of um, normatize, um, you know, non, non-traditional um, roles and language. And um, I've, I've just begun trying to, trying to do that in, you know, my own speaking and my exam questions and, and how I write about things um, and um, see where it goes. I, I have an, a, a, a paper where they have to write to an ambassador of a country. Um, and I use the pronoun she when I'm referring to, to the, um, to the audience. And so it could be something as simple as that, where perhaps people might see themselves represented in a way that, that they wouldn't otherwise. Okay. Ling, do you have anything to add? No. Okay. Well, okay. let's move to the uh, next question. It's from Gina Peters and it's for Paul. And it's basically asking, do you have a source that aggregates and sends you economics relevant uh, articles or are you actually doing the searching yourself? Right. Um, in all honesty, I'm, I'm doing a lot of search myself. Prior to my stint here in academia, I was a market economist and interest rate strategist at a, a local bro national broker dealer. Uh, and in that period, uh, you know, I got used to reading everything from what the Fed was published, the Federal Reserve was publishing, you know, all the way down to anything in popular culture and all things in between in order to kind of put everything together. Um, one thing I did find that was helpful, though, as a starting point. So long story short, I, you know, I know the routes that I want to take, but I did started going to uh, Google News and going to their business section because I found that they do a decent job of trying to aggregate a lot of information. Um, so it puts a lot of articles in front of me, but I also have a lot of my own professional sources that I use as well. Great okay. question. Great. Thanks very much. Now, Paul, uh, the, the next question is for you. As well. Carlos, I think we probably need to draw a line under it in about okay. 10 seconds. So if the question's quick, that would be fine. But... Right. Well, I'll, I'll pass on to, to, to Clodagh then, if we're running out of time. Um, Clodagh wants to... Give yeah, thank you. Audience, so. Sorry to rudely interrupt. I know that there's lots of questions still to get through, but we do want to give people a little break before the mixer session. Um, thank you to all our speakers and to Carlos for chairing. Um, you can see from the chat that we're all quite passionate about this. Um, as an Irish person, I like to always speak proper English, um, which is the theme of the end of the chat. Um, Big thank you to our student support, Ian Yasmin, and to the student partners who worked on the asynchronous material, which is still all available on our website. Huge thank you to Maddie for organizing us all. Um, just two reminders. One is that we are moving into our mixer session with Ed, um, which you will have a separate link for. Tomorrow you'll get a set feedback form about this session, so please do take the time to fill that in. And then as we mentioned already in the chat, all the questions, all the chat will be collated together into a document that will be shared when everyone's had a chance to feed into it. So have yourself a little break and hope to do join us in the networking session in about five minutes. Thank you everyone again.